I'm Lori McLaughlin, Chief Marketing Officer here at Digital Onboarding. Let's get started. So I just wanted to start with a couple of slides for those of you that don't know who we are. Um, our platform helps banks and credit unions grow the value of their existing base. So you've probably got platforms and tools out there for advertising and to acquire new customers and members. Our platform picks up as soon as new accounts are opened and ensures that the accounts you're opening turn into lasting, engaged, and profitable relationships. And we're gonna get into a lot more details about this um, later in the presentation, but just very simply, our platform enables institutions to trigger email and text messages that link people out to their personal microsites. And that's where the real magic happens because this isn't a platform that just lets you communicate and tell people what to do. It lets you help them do the things. And so our platform comes with a library of widgets that are built for banks and credit unions. It helps people accomplish tasks like setting up for direct, signing up for direct deposits in seconds. We've got over 140 customers, a 97% overall satisfaction rating, and here's some of the logos and people that we work with. All right, so in terms of today, we're gonna to be talking about proven strategies to maximize deposits, card transactions, cross-sell rates, digital banking adoption, e-statements, courtesy pay, and overdraft enrollment. So it's the start of the year, and I'm sure we're all um, making plans for these things. Adam, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Awesome, thanks Lori, and welcome everybody. So one of the first things we wanted to talk about a little bit today is uh, growing deposits. So, you know, we've talked to you quite frequently. I think if you've seen our platform in the past, we talk about direct deposits and some of the ways we help with that. We're gonna overview that again today. And then we're gonna talk about two relatively new use cases and some case studies and results that we've seen in these spaces um, for high yield checking and savings, as well as certificates of deposits, which are two really uh, topical conversations, obviously, with the changes in the rate environments uh, within the industry. So, so when we talk about direct deposits, uh, one of the, it's obviously a really important part of primacy. But if you think about it from the customer perspective or the member perspective, those first ninety days they're really confusing. And as an industry, you know what we've seen is that a lot of people just aren't actually enrolling in the products and services that we want them to take up. That really underpin that active and engaged relationship. And the reason is we are typically using kind of antiquated methods to get that done. We're using email blast campaigns, we're using PDF forms. And in the digital world we live in today, people just don't tend to engage with those types of environments. And so that's resulted in a real high attrition rate. Um, on average, when we talk to our clients uh, before they onboard to our solution, it's usually about 25 to 40 percent. And a lot of that depends on how they're opening accounts, whether they're in branch or online. Um, but again, those are really difficult uh, results to swallow when you look at the amount of money it costs to actually acquire a new membership or a new um, checking account relationship. Yeah, and Adam, uh, Melissa and I were talking about this um, problem of friction um, during the onboarding process. And Melissa's got a kind of good analogy about a front and a back door. And I thought she could kind of talk about this problem and what, what institutions need to do differently. Sure, thank you, Lori. So I, I think a lot of it comes down to as marketers and as salespeople in general, you get so focused on getting the shiny new customer, right? We spent all this money, all this energy on this new customer. Um, we, we're excited, we onboard them, and then you know we forget about them. Or we're so focused on our new shiny customer, then people start leaving. And so I say, we're opening the front door to welcome the new customer, but we left the back door open to let the cust other customers escape. <laughs> and not that we really wanna trap them like that, but yeah. Why not? So thinking through that, once they leave, we're spending more and more time to capture them again or someone like them. So we're just making this vicious cycle. So it just speaks to the value of onboarding, not just immediately, but the constant communication with that and helpful things. Of course, we all want to sell our products and services, but never underestimate the power of a, a birthday email or anything like that. 
Yeah, I thought that was really good advice. Um, Neobanks or digital banks opened almost half of all checking accounts last year. When you acquire a customer member, it's really important that you keep them. And Daniel, we talked a lot about the competitiveness in the marketplace today and what institutions need to do differently. What's your perspective and advice? Yeah, I really like to, to go back to what Melissa said there. I like that, that we really focus on, you know, getting them in. But once they're in, I think that we really have to be, you know, if I was to summarize it right away, it's ease of use for the consumer and the consumer's experience. And we have to be pretty unrelenting in that area. Because uh, let's face it, you know, every FI out there has checking accounts and every FI out there has great rates and blah, blah, blah. Their, their member service and customer service is the best, right? They're, it's all the same, right? We're commodities. But what I believe the biggest difference maker is that we're anticipating and eliminating those friction points. And starting off, I mean, people don't want checking accounts just to say, I have another checking account. They want it to, you know, make their lives easier, make payments easier. Um, so, you know, helping them out so that they can get that direct deposit set up, they can start actually engaging with your services is really critical. So I think that's kind of the direction that we go. And I, I really unrelentingly focus on ease of use. And, um, you know, a lot of times for smaller organizations like ours, that means that we have to bring in partners and utilize external resources to provide that ease of use. Thank you. Those are great points. Um, one of the, you know, one of the easy ways we can really help with this is through the use of some of those tools that um, Daniel was kind of talking about. So one of them is our direct deposit uh, functionality and what we offer in that space. So first and foremost, we can offer the user the ability to get access to secure information. And this is usually one of the biggest hurdles they have when signing up for a number of services, direct deposit being one of them. So whether they've opened that account in the branch and you've handed them a piece of paper with some information on it, they've then gone to work and left that at home and they're trying to sign up within uh, their organization for direct deposit, or maybe they've opened the account online, same kind of use case, they just forgot to write that, that account number or member number down, and now they're faced with this challenge. Most people are not gonna bother to pick up the phone and call the branch or call the call center to try and get access to this information. So we can do it securely within our journeys. Um, really simple, lightweight authentication where we send them a, a code, they enter that code back into the system and we're able to re reveal that secure information. So then they can move forward with the process. Yeah, and Adam, another use case, uh, Melissa, I know that the Middlefield Banking Company recently went through an M&A event and this functionality came in handy. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, we just officially finished. It's been one, one full year, but only since April, since conversion. So if you've been through that, you know, I don't recommend it, but unfortunately it's part of business, but we're stronger together. Um, and I think letting our customers know that they can change anyone who had an account number change, they could easily go in here and do this. It takes the pain out of it. And even if they were a 20 plus year you know, customer member, they don't always remember that, like they said, and then calling and asking. So we said that these are great reference guides. We kept calling them the quick reference guide more so than the onboarding, even though that's what it was. But we wanted to try to take, like we've already talked about, the friction, the pain. Uh, do I really have to call you to ask you what my account number is? Where can I find this? You know, all of that stuff. So it's just a little thing, but just showing the customer that you understand what it's going to take for them to you know, change things. Um, it just makes it a little easier for them. And if they don't utilize it, you still offered. So to me, that's half the battle if we're offering. Awesome. Cool. And so one of the case studies we have on our website, and, and I'll just mention that if you do go to digitalonboarding.com and you click on the resources tab, you can get access to any of these. Um, there, there's no gating mechanism there. So really easy to, to look into any of these case studies that we're going to profile today. And obviously a lot more of them there as well. Um, we had one with CU of Texas recently, really interesting use case. They were using an industry leading CRM um, and sending out an email blast and doing you know, a pretty, what we would call a typical type of onboarding style campaign to try and you know, get engagement. And what they found was that just weren't seeing the results that they really wanted to. And so they um, ran the campaign using digital onboarding with our personalized journeys, following up with emails and text messages. And what they found was an increase in not only direct deposit, e-statements, online banking use, usage and adop adoption, but they also were able to get some SMS adoption, which they weren't able to do within the previous journeys. But the headline here is they were able to increase that 
direct deposit by 375%. So a huge result, um, obviously utilizing both that secure personalization and another feature that we'll talk about here in a second, which is our direct deposit widget. So the direct deposit widget allows a member or a customer to go in and say they you know, search for either their employer or their online payroll uh, provider. So a lot of people know the payroll providers, right? They're common companies, ADP, Paychex. Um, we use JustWorks within our environment. So they're able to search for that really quickly, enter their credentials that they would use to typically log in. And we'll do the rest of the work for them other than they'll select, you know, how much of their paycheck they actually want to want to utilize, want to put into that account. But we'll do the rest of the work, right? We'll log into the back end of the system. We'll update the, the records. And then we'll send them an email to confirm that it got done and give them the opportunity to move additional paychecks. That's a really core use case, especially when you're looking at that gig economy where people are typically not just working for one provider like Lyft or Uber, they're working for multiples, DoorDash, Lyft, Uber, um, et cetera. So really great piece of functionality that we can offer to the market there. So the second use case that we talked about at the beginning um, around to direct or around deposits uh, was CDs, right? And getting renewals for CDs. So what we found, this is actually brought on by feedback from a couple of customers that had said to us, you know, we struggle with the nature of our systems and our data models and also with just how we actually have to engage when we try to get responses around cds and they become really popular and really important in today's rate environment so a couple things that happen one the data model it's flat right so they have an individual record for each individual account that they're running and so they have to send multiple communications to the user even though they may have multiple cds that are expiring within a, a reasonable time frame that, that they need a response on the other thing that they run into is obviously the cost and you know time it takes for somebody to actually provide these responses. So with our new tactical campaign management, we're able to send out these campaigns, um, show them all the different CDs that they have that are expiring within a specific time, and then let them select and elect what the option is they want to do for those individual use cases. This means that they're not losing those CDs to other financial institutions or just rolling those CDs forward and having a an issue with the client later that's calling in and saying, hey, how did this happen? What, you know, why didn't you communicate to me? Um, or why didn't I have an opportunity to, to address this? So really great piece of functionality. And Lori, I think you were going to talk about this one. Yeah, you know, I've been in this industry a long time. I did not know about this problem or this challenge. Kevin Randall at US Alliance actually educated me on it. But, you know, we learn about challenges. We build features for them. Daniel, you and I talked about this challenge and how time consuming it is to have to message separately about different products. Can, can you share more about that? Yeah, and I think that kind of speaks to... Uh... You know, we're all different, right? So um, here at Buckeye State Credit Union, we're about 140 million in assets and we punch pretty far above our weight, but I'm sure there's probably some financial institutions on this webinar that are, you know, worth of multiple billions and you're gonna have different assets and you're gonna have different abilities to maneuver these things. So um, what we kind of struggle with is the data that we can extract out of our core operating system and then how we get that to our teams to then communicate with the members. So what we found is that we need to kind of, like I was talking a few minutes ago, back to, you know, ease of use, using external partners to kind of set these preferences, get that communication out on an automated method so that it, it's set, forget, and then it comes in and then we can start engaging with their members based on the preferences that they're selecting. Yeah. It also, another thing that we're, you know, we've found that if you're relying on, let's say I generate a list and I put it out there and I'm like, Hey, loan officers, you know, work off this list, right? Each one of those people are going to get a completely unique experience based on that loan officer that reached out. This allows everyone to have a consistent starting point, And then we can really, you know, take the service from there and, you know, meet the needs of the client. But it, it's it's happening in a fast automated method. And I don't have to think about CDs that are renewing today. We just have this constantly set for CDs that are renewing ongoing in perpetuity. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Two really great points, right? The, the idea that inconsistency of, of the uh, human element um, and obviously you know having this campaign set up kind of set it and forget it where it runs without you having to run a project on a regular basis so love that 
Uh, the last use case that we talked about within this um, section was a little bit about high yield account requirements. So obviously, again, really important aspect right now. Uh, and a couple of get really frustrated when they have a high yield savings account, but they're not getting that yield because they miss some sort of criteria. And so what we've seen is, you know, we can use our system to alert and and advise them on what the parameters are and where they're falling short in those specific areas or where they're coming close, right? So if their balance is starting to get close to that limit or there's you know low on transactions for a given period of time, we can offer them uh, education on what they need to do and offer some self-service tools to have them get that adoption, so. Yeah, and you know, if you're offering a high yield account, you know, we all know cash bonuses are widely used in the industry. But sometimes you can just rely on the product benefits that you already have. And I know that's something that Melissa, um, you know, they're focused on with their um, debit rewards program. Can you tell us how you're thinking about that, Melissa? Sure. I'm sure most of us on this call have gone to bat with executives over cash bonuses at one time. I won't get into that story, but I will tell you, we have an existing program. It's a cash back rewards checking account. And you know, you've seen these plenty of times, you use your debit card a certain amount and you can earn cash back rewards. So uh, our system right now is $180, but we would have customers, it's the easiest one to sell uh, because it's the free account with e-statement. So people would be dumped into that account, um, you know, maybe given a debit card, but not really um, knowing the benefits. So I'm part of the onboard of that, uh, after the initial onboard, we usually try to wait 90 days to wait them switch over, hopefully have everything over to our account. It's their primary or however that works. And we're able to offer this. There's no lift from our deposit operations team. There's no tracking for marketing other than just success. But I don't have to look at this every day and go, oh, I need to pay out Mrs. Smith $15 this month. The automation that runs through our core banking system to pay these people out is already there. I just have to incent them to put our card on the top of the wallet and change some behaviors. And I don't have to offer any more money that we weren't planning on, right? Some of this is part of the budget. So really, other than showing high utilization for the account, I don't have a lot of people on my back telling me, why are you doing this? Why are you giving away money? I mean, of course, someday I hope that they question that because it's so successful, but it's really gaining some traction and people appreciate it or they forgot. You know, we've had people who were like nine months in that are like, oh, wow, yeah, I need to do that. And we especially do it around the holidays, make sure we get back on top of the wallet. But it's a very easy thing. It just took some communication. The back end was already built. And it's, it's been great so far. People, it's helpful. I'm trying to give you more money, right? We all, we all like to hear that. Yes, for sure. Best headline ever. <laughs> awesome. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a later section. But, uh, you know, one of the case studies that we do have on our website about this one specifically is P1 FCU. So similar kind of concept, right? They have that rewards checking account. They're really trying to get adoption for these different services. They were seeing that people were falling short in both direct deposit and also the e-statement criteria there. Uh, so they ran two separate campaigns, one for just people who hadn't done the direct deposit piece and one for direct deposit and e-statements. Got increased adoption in both areas, but you know, big goal here was you know getting that direct deposit, right? So 60% higher, um, enrollments than their goal for that direct deposit. And thing to note here is these are existing members, right? They've already been onboarded, gone through the whole process. So this is a part of the uh, the platform that kind of gets, um, you know, forgotten sometimes with, uh, with some of our sales efforts when we're out there in the field, people don't realize we are not only just onboarding these new customers, but there's onboarding that goes on with existing customers, right? You can increase adoption with those relationships and make them stickier, so. If I can interject one quick thing on that, um, we found when we were in introducing new rewards products that not everyone has access to direct deposit the way that you just said, the gig economy. So we change it to direct deposit or mobile deposit. However, you're getting paid if you still, or mm -hmm. if you're working for a small company, just try to make it a little more flexible. Obviously the same point for, for all of us bankers, just trying to make it a sticky relationship. We don't, we don't want you to go anywhere. We want you to tie your money with us and we want to reward you for doing so. So just thinking through that, if you ever have any issues with it, um, think about being just slightly more flexible and, and you might have some better results. Great advice. Yeah, great, great point. So let's talk a little bit about um, another use case we've got here, which is maximizing card transactions. Obviously a key part of uh, revenue generation for, for any financial institution is that interchange rate. So uh, 
One of the things we've seen, and I think everybody in the industry has seen, is that bill pay is really waning, right? Um, it's reducing in volume. Uh, I've seen a lot of anecdotal evidence of that, but, you know, some good stats here where you're seeing, you know, much bigger growth within the direct payments than you are within that that bill pay element, 20 times faster um, in this example. So, you know, and 80% of Americans are making a payment through some sort of direct billers structure. So we need to make it easy for them to update those default payments. And we're going to show you a little bit about a widget, but then I'm also going to demo it here um, in a little bit. And I'll talk about a, a really good use case for that. So what we can do is we can offer them the ability to not only move those kind of reoccurring payments that they have through um, that they may have used the biller, um, your, your online bill payment solution for before, but we can also help them with like subscriptions and online retailers to make sure that we make it as easy as possible. So we'll let them update that default card method. We'll let them do it multiple places at one in one go. And so this just simplifies the process. It kind of goes to what Melissa and Daniel have been talking about over and over again. It's just about ease of utilization, right? It's not that the user can't do these things on their own, but the amount of time it takes for them to move and navigate to all those different sites figure out where those card details are stored, make sure they re-enter it over and over and over again. It sort of takes the, um, you know, some people will just lose the will to actually get it done. So, Yeah, and um, Melissa, I know that the Middlefield Banking Company used this um, feature during the m and Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that's a great use case for it. Cool. Uh, uh, one quick thing, something that we found out on this, a huge thing with debit card when you get a new debit card is remembering to change things other than just the merchants, but like Venmo. There were people that were getting paid through amounts. So even if they weren't utilizing the tool, we reminded them this debit card has changed. We don't want your Netflix to be shut off. We don't want your cell phone to be shut off. And we definitely don't want you to miss Venmo payments. So that was a great reason to get it back in front of them. There's over 700 different merchants and people in there. So uh, I, I challenge people to look through that list to jog their memories. If they're not utilizing it, it's just a good reminder. So they're not mad at us later when they didn't make yeah. that payment or something happened. Awesome. Great point. So we've got another really cool case study on our website. This is uh, Deseret First. Uh, essentially what they were trying to do is increase that debit card utilization, right? They used our widget to, to promote this element. What they did was they offered an incentive based on the number of different switches you made, right? So if you made one switch, they gave you um, a small bonus. As you made more and more switches, they gave you a larger, larger bonus. And so what they found is a huge increase in debit card spending and utilization across those in individuals who engage with the campaign. So, you know, you can take a look at this on the website, but obviously sort of supports what we've been talking about here with the other, um, the other stories. One of the other things is top of wall, top of phone status, right? So we all think about top of wallet. We talk about top of wallet, but so many people are using a digital wallet these days. Uh, I very rarely, I don't remember the last time I left my house and forgot my cell phone, but I definitely forget my wallet from time to time for whatever reason. Uh, and it's really convenient to just pull the phone out and use, use my wallet um, or mobile wallet to make those payments. And so what we've seen is that that's actually kind of happening across all the different consumer bases, right? So 53% of people are using their digital wallet more than they're using a card on a regular transaction, right? Um, and physical cards are just declining in, in utilization. So what we want is that top of phone status. So we want to make that easy as well. So the other thing, and, and Melissa talked a little, we'll, um, I think, add here around that M&A story, but card replacements are just happening more frequently, right? So we're issuing a lot of cards. Most people use cards for most of their transactions, as we talked about previously. But you're also seeing fraud increases where you're having to reissue cards for those reasons. Um, cards are expiring and having to be reissued as well. And so we want to make sure that we remind the user that when they get a new card, hey, there are payments that we need to update. There are different things we need to change and make it as easy as possible. So I think we've got some um, thoughts on that one. I'll leave it to you. Yeah, no, I think we covered it. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, everyone understood this is great for M&A. Um, and really any time that someone is getting a new card. Um... Cool. So then one of the newer features, and this one's really exciting, um, when we talk about some of those rewards checking accounts and talking about getting people to engage with some of these different pieces of functionality that we're trying to get them to do to, to get that um, fully engaged in active membership or um, relationship. 
We want to offer them incentives on top of that, and we want to make that as easy as possible. So new product feature here that we're going to be launching um, in, in the very short order. It's actually done with development. We're just going through um, some testing and going to move it into our, our beta process here shortly. But it'll allow us to not only um, track those rewards within our platform, but it'll allow us to additionally make it dynamic how we reward people for different elements of the journey, right? So say we want to give somebody 25 points for signing up for text messages, but we want to give them 200 points if they put in 50% of their check and maybe 400 points if they put in their whole entire check. Uh, maybe we're going to give them 25 points for every single merchant that they sign up for. So we can make that really dynamic. We can reward them in there. We can also do some celebration around it. We can, you know, put off confetti and, and show them different elements to sort of encourage their utilization of these different features. So this is, I think, going to be a really, really powerful element of how we go to market um, in the future and really help our our customers get even better engagement than they're getting today with the platforms. Uh, next, we're going to talk a little bit about cross-sell rates. So again, you know, we talk a lot about onboarding. When we talk about stuff, we talk, talk a lot about reboarding, which is something we were kind of talking about here uh, recently. But cross-sell is a huge element of our, our platform. But the reality is most cross-sell efforts fall short, primarily because you don't really have a relationship in the first place. You haven't actually gone through the process of developing that user or that member into something uh, more than just, you know, uh, uh, an account. Uh, so what we really want to do is build that foundational relationship and then do our cross selling on top of it. And the data shows that that's really important. So, yeah. And this is a common mistake. I've seen it so many times where institutions right after someone opens an account, they start trying to sell them a bunch of other things. And once again, Melissa is on the spot here with a great analogy about what happens when you're at a restaurant and your food gets delivered. Um, how do you position this problem? So staying with my same thing, if I invite you to my house, right, you're my brand new shiny customer, I can't wait to give you all of the wonderful things I prepared, but that's just not how it works. I'm um, thinking about the last time you sat down for dinner and you order an appetizer and salad and it all comes up stacked all together. You're so overwhelmed by all that, that, you know, you don't enjoy the experience. So the way that I think about it is pacing it out. You know, we've seen customers that didn't look at our onboarding email for four months, but also think about if they are shifting their primary checking account, they're still going between those two accounts for a while. So I guess my advice is don't rush it, you know, give them little pieces of information, refer back to it, right? It's your menu in this scenario, but just don't rush everything and don't uh, harp on the appetizers for too long or some other analogy like that. So just make them enjoy the experience, have the information there, but just don't rush it and don't forget about it after it's been even 90 days. Yeah, great points. And on top of that, you know, sort of foundational element of getting that onboarding done before you start to do that cross-selling is the importance of, of relevancy and personalization. So, you know, if we're not personalizing these offers, it's just a shotgun approach, right? And we all get this stuff from time to time. Um, I get a ton of emails uh, at a work at a work level that are just kind of like, these have nothing to do with me. Um, and I instantly delete them, right? I'm sure most people are common with that. Uh, and what we can do is leverage that transactional data to really make these personalized offers to make sure that they're relevant to that individual at the specific time. Or even better, we can use our survey widget to ask them what's important to them and what's going to be happening in the near future. So, you know, let's just ask them like, hey, what are important life events that are coming up? Are you looking, are you trying to save for a house? Are you trying to make a down payment? Are you, you know, worried about college savings? Those are really important things that sometimes they'll just tell you and drive you right down the path of where you need to help them. So. Yeah, and Daniel, I thought made an excellent point. You know, ease of use also means relevancy. My, you know, some of the institutions I do business with are huge and they send me stuff that has nothing to do with me. What do you have to say about that, Daniel? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big broken record about uh, ease of use, but you've also got to take in the other factors in mind and that personalization is right there, right? So I think that using tools like this and extracting data points to make sure that the offers to that relevant side, um, you know, we've all, you know, met the criteria of having a pulse when you walk into Chase and you get, a credit card offer slammed right in your face, right? And that just doesn't feel very appropriate. Um, here, uh, I, we're my headquarters out of Akron, Ohio, and we have a lot of members that are quite affluent, but we also have a large or low moderate income or a CDFI. So if I'm sending out offers to my members that are, you know, behind on loans, um, they're, you know, uh, 
cash flow constrained, FICO scores are, you know, need enhancement. If I'm sending them offers about my great money market rate, that's going to seem really tone deaf. But um, so what we are doing with digital onboarding is we're actually partnering with, with other sources to extract even more dialed in data points, um, you know, credit score things and other factors that can be found. So that way we're making sure that, that our, our offers don't come across as and I hate to beat up on Chase, but I, I can't say I hate. I actually like it. But um, I don't ever want to be that place that says, hey, you're alive. Here's a credit card offer. No, I want my offers to be relevant while being easy to use, easy to understand. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. Um, and one of the things about these personalized offers is not only just you know making them relevant, but let's make it easy for them to actually adopt these different services. And we've seen this happen with a couple of our clients. Some really cool use cases. We've got a great one um, on our website where we had somebody you know utilizing this for a credit card offer that they had previously previously sending out some postcards and then ended up using our en enrollment widget to allow them to accept terms and conditions um, and sign up for it really easily. So check that one out as well. Um, one of the good ones we've got here to profile is around certified federal. So they were doing a typical campaign, right? Sending emails uh, that were not personalized, sending out a letter, um, doing mobile app notifications, but they just weren't seeing the adoption they really wanted to see. And so what they did is they added some elements to that campaign, um, made it more personalized with our platform because they had the data available to do so. And they saw double the uh, credit card cross sell rate within that population. So really powerful, really powerful story. There's also two great examples around indirect lending. I'll talk about really quickly. Um, indirect lending, obviously a core element of a lot of credit union strategies. And what we've seen is that, you know, the holy grail is to be able to get those members to engage more and to cross sell them of, uh, other products and services to turn them into real proper members instead of just that indirect relationship. And so um, we've got a, a large credit union that had, 13% more products adopted um, just by doing cross-sell offers once they've done a proper onboarding campaign and they use this personalized uh, microsites and embedded signup forms to just make that as simple as possible. We also had another uh, uh, billion dollar credit union that was trying to move people into new checking accounts, right? Getting that primary relationship. And so what they were able to do is again, use, utilize a lot of those same components and get a better adoption uh, of new checking account opens. This is a really, really important strategy uh, for most credit unions when they're in that ring direct lending space. So, um, Another element of, of onboarding that we forget about as an industry is that the friction around downloading mobile apps. So one of the things I have to do quite frequently when we do customized demos is I have to go search for these apps. As you can see, it's sort of an example here where you know just searching for the word members, you're gonna end up with a huge amount of different uh, credit unions or, or uh, components where you've got overlap there. Um, also, sometimes I'll put in the whole entire name of the credit union and just not get a app back, right? I don't know why it doesn't show, show it back in the different app stores, um, but if you run into that, friction if you're an individual it's just going to be very frustrating maybe you're going to call the call center and be upset uh, but it's not a great experience to start off the relationship on so just something we want to you know make as easy as possible and we'll show you within the demo how we make this really really simple so i'll profile this a little bit more in the demo um we also want to remove any of the barriers around signing up for like digital banking. So we show that secure personalization around direct deposit. It's also used a lot of times for this uh, opening or accessing a relationship there. So um, definitely an important part of, of, of our platform is to use that secure personalization, just make it easy and have all the information readily available for the user as they're going through the process. So. Uh, Truestone, a uh, great, great case study here. Um, I think we all think that there's just that member population that's never gonna engage in our digital tools for whatever reason, right? Uh, they've never signed up, they've been here for a long time, they must just not want to use digital banking. And so they had that kind of an attitude um, with some of their folks internally. And they just said, you know what, we're gonna set a goal to try and increase the number of users within this existing population. And so they ran a campaign utilizing the platform and they saw it, they beat that goal uh, of getting additional members converted by 263%. So huge, huge opportunity um, there to just increase adoption of those digital tools, obviously reduce your cost of service um, and give a better experience to those individuals. So. Uh, Harborstone, similar kind of concept, right? So looking to increase that digital adoption, utilization, 
um, utilize the platform, email and text message personalized microsites, that QR code, um, and we're able to increase their digital adoption by 60%. So. Let's talk a little bit about e-statements, courtesy pay and overdraft. So, um, you know, obviously e-statements is a big cost for financial institutions. You know, we see this range wildly, right? Like some some credit unions and, and banks are doing really, really well in this space and have high, high adoption rates and other ones have very low adoption rates. But as an industry, we're only at about 52%, which is, you know, given how digital we are today, that seems pretty, uh, pretty low. And so part of it's just, it takes time and it's hard to enroll. And most people think, well, I can make it easy within digital banking. The issue is that most users spend less than 90 seconds in digital banking and they're there for a real reason, right? I'm moving money, I'm checking a balance, I'm making a payment. Uh, those are the why they come in. They're not hunting and pecking, looking around for different features and functionalities. And we see oftentimes that's kind of the strategy. Hey, we've built out this great digital tool and it's got all these capabilities, but does the user even know they're there or are they even spending time in there to actually look at it? So um, we can make this super, super simple within our um, application. We can allow them to sign up for those services with that enrollment widget just allows them to really easily make that selection right there, accept terms and conditions, put in their information and move on. Um, no logging into additional systems, no remembering usernames and passwords. Uh, OCCU, great, great case study on our website. This is around indirect lending. So they really, really wanted to make sure uh, that they could move these individuals into e-statements as they um, came into their organization from a uh, indirect perspective utilized our, our solution and saw a huge, huge adoption rate um, compared to what they saw previously. So. Um, I'm not seeing a question in the Q&A yet. Um, are you? Sorry, Lori. Uh, question I Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, for courtesy pay and overdraft, um, obviously an important strategy for, for a lot of organizations to drive some of that fee income. Um, but you really you, you need to make sure that they make the election, right? Are they going to be utilizing uh, overdraft privileges? Are they not going to be use, utilizing overdraft privileges? So those reggie decisions become really, really important. Uh, another example of where we've used that enrollment widget to make those elections super easy within that account opening workflow, or even to follow up with existing customers and members to get that adoption later. Um, so most households, you know, have overdraft fees from time to time. Um, you know, it's an important element of service for the uh, organization to make sure that, you know, it's embarrassing if you swipe your debit card and it doesn't go through. So, you know, offering that tool is important, but explaining to the user, like what it is, why it's important, you know, how they utilize it, what are the fees associated with it is also really important to make sure that you're being transparent. So. All right, we're gonna do a quick poll question and then we're gonna to cut to a platform demonstration. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to answer and then I'll, we'll share the results. Which of the following are strategic priorities for your institution? Raising more deposits, increasing card transactions, cross-selling more, growing digital banking usage, increased e-statement adoption or increasing overdraft and courtesy pay adoption. Few more seconds and we'll reveal. All right, so deposits is still the hot topic with 73% saying yes, um, followed by cross sell and digital banking usage in second and third tied. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to switch over to the demo here real quick. So, Let's get started with this. Great. Okay, so um, for those of you who are, have not seen the platform uh, before, we'll kind of run you through a checking activation. Also talk about some of these use cases we just just went through. So uh, typically we're gonna reach out to the user with any method we have available, right? So if they've got um, an email and a text message, we're gonna reach out in both. Um, in this case, I've got an email for opening a brand new checking account at my financial institution. So I'm gonna click on it. It's gonna take me to this personalized microsite. So when I talk about a personalized microsite, it's not just, you know, 
for me individually and in, in my name, but the steps that you're going to see are, are dynamic and depend on me as a user and where I'm at within my relationship with the organization. So this is my first account with the, the organization. So I have not signed up for things like online banking or mobile banking, but say I had this is the second account, I may already have some of these services established. And so we'd be running the exact same campaign to those users. They just may not see certain steps. We may have completed them in the back end. And so it's dynamic both in, you know, personalization on like what is the content that they're going to see, um, but also like personalization of their name and other elements uh, uh, as well. So, um, so let's walk down this path. The first thing we're going to do is use our um, uh, texting uh, consent form. So what we want to do here is get consent. Now, a lot of organizations are not using text for anything other than alerts right now, but still really important to get this consent. If you remember getting e-statement cons or sorry, email consent after the fact was really complicated. Um, we'll, if we want to use this later down the road, it's important to do that. So here we'll send a text message to them. They can view the terms and conditions. We'll also make them click a link to prove that they have ownership of the device. Um, so one way we can get consent for that, we can also do this for email as well, which we have a couple of customers who do that, so. Yeah, and for all the marketers on the phone, the click-through rates on text messages are way higher than emails. So you definitely wanna be using it. Great. Um, for uh, direct deposit, we showed you a couple of the things. So we'll talk about them here. So obviously we have that personal secure personalization where I can send that code over. So I'll quickly send a code to myself, uh, get it over here in my, Inbox, grab that code, copy it, and place it right back into that verification window, hit submit, and now I've got that account number revealed. There'll be other elements of this journey, like we mentioned online banking, where that um, I'm gonna need that element as well. It's there as well. This only holds for uh, 30 minutes. So if I leave the journey, if I end up coming back later, I may have to do that uh, re-authentication. So there's some security around it to make sure that the user just doesn't leave it there um, in perpetuity. So. Also, we can use that widget that we mentioned before. So that direct deposit widget, um, I'm just going to, for ease of use, I'm gonna use uh, JustWorks, which is what we use for our HR portal. Um, I'm able to put in my username and credentials like we talked about previously. When I put that in and hit, um, uh, hit the credentials in, I'm able to select an entire amount, percentage, specific amount. As I mentioned before, um, with that new rewards functionality, we can reward them based on what percentage they put in or if they put the entire amount. So really cool element. We also store this in the back. So if you want to run a subsequent campaign to say, everybody who didn't give me their whole entire paycheck, I want to go after them for the rest of that paycheck. Um, we can do that. So they enter, they want the whole paycheck, hit confirm. And again, we'll do everything for the user at this point. We'll log in, update all those records um, and make sure that they have everything available to them and then remind or send them an email to let them know that it's actually been completed. So make that super simple. For card payments, we talked about this widget as well. Um, I'll use a couple that are really important. So we, you know, we talked about major retailers. We talked about subscription services. We also talked about those bill pay elements like AT and T, right? So um, this one very easy. User puts in the card details one time. When they put that card detail in, and hit continue, they're going to see uh, a list of all those login screens. So able to quickly put in those logins, hit submit, and then we'll make sure that that goes top of wallet. So all the future transactions will go through. Um, so in the case of Amazon, you may have multiple payment methods. This will replace that top of wallet payment. So Yeah, and so Adam, they never even need to go to those sites. Once they submit, the, the payment update has been changed. Correct. Online banking, again, just make it easy, right? We're going to direct them to that online enrollment page, page that you already have, but they need that account number or member number information. Um, so we make it really easily available here to them right here. We talked about mobile banking. This will show you an example of like embedding a video. So we can embed videos directly in here, maybe talk about the value and capabilities that you've got within your mobile banking application. Um, they can put in a number and send themselves a text if they were on a... Um, a mobile device already, they just have an install now link. Um, and that install now link would work exactly like this QR code. Um, what the QR code does is when they scan it, it's going to recognize what type of device they have, right? So it's not going to ask them, is this an Apple device or is this a, a Google device? It's going to know which one it is and it's going to direct them to the right app store. So again, just reducing some of that friction uh, that you typically see within this process. 
talk about our enrollment widgets. We talked about a couple different use cases that you, you know, e-statements being one, consenting for specific products and services. We've seen people use it for like gap insurance. We've seen people use it for um, specific products that they want somebody to enroll in. We've also seen for making reg e decisions. So what they're able to do is say, yes, I want to sign up for that service. If you notice, I cannot hit this submit button at the moment, and that's because I have not viewed the terms and conditions. So we'll have to go view the terms and conditions. Once they view those terms and conditions, they're able to hit that submit button um, and then move through the process. We'll record that action within our system. And we also have web hooks to return it back to any downstream systems, um, including digital banking platforms and course. And then the last piece of this demo is just to go through a survey. So um, we mentioned before, like, you know, what are the, some of the important financial decisions you need to make uh, coming up? So we may select, you know, I'm looking for an auto loan and a mortgage, hit next. And then how was the service itself? Um, so we can put, you know, multiple questions, different types of answers. Um, in this case, it's one answer. In the previous, it was multiple answers. Uh, hit submit, and then we record those survey actions. Those are available within our platform. You can also retarget based on them. So you could have a campaign set up for a mortgage. You could have a campaign set up for an auto loan. And when they select that, they're going to automatically get that campaign. So you don't have to follow up um, with the individual. The system will automatically do it for you. So. Yeah, and yep. for those for those FIs on the phone, I know, <laughs> Daniel, we talked earlier about how important it is to make your cross-sell offers relevant. I also know that a lot of you may not have access to big data or segmentation. Just to quote our chief product officer, sometimes the best way to figure out what someone needs is just to ask them. And that's what the survey widget does. And now that it's connected with the auto campaign trigger, you can ask and deliver um, automatically. I think one thing, like if I could add to that too, is that we're, I, the last thing we want to be is that annoying financial institution that's just constantly like calling our members and saying, hi, can I sell you something? But I think when you're getting good data like that, we can arm our teams to have robust conversations that are tailored to the needs that people are telling us, right? If I say, hey, we, I, I'm going to run an auto promo next month, but my member might have no interest in talking about an auto loan, but they really want to, they're feeling insecure about retirement. So this way we could hear what's important to them and then drive the right people to connect with them. Yeah. And there's just a couple more things I wanted to say, because just when you, you, you made me think of it, um, if you didn't notice, the microsites also have the ability to embed your chat tool. So you can give people the ability to complete tasks, but you can also talk them through it and even screen share, um, which is really great. Um, all right, we've got our final poll question. Um, this is most important to me. Uh, <laughs> would you like a custom platform demo? And if you say yes, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a campaign branded for your institution to show you how this could work for you. So just take a minute and fill that out. Um, and then we're going to move on to some final words. All right. So I did want to um, give the opportunity, you know, we've talked about a lot of things today and I've had much longer conversations with Melissa and Daniel and I know how much good advice they have to share. Um, so I kind of, before we get to questions, um, I wanted to start with Daniel because you started to talk about, you know, the strategy um, at Buckeye State and this idea of steering people into and away from products. And I thought it was pretty brilliant. And I was hoping you could explain a little bit about that. Well, you could say it's brilliant, but um, <clears throat> I'm really good at stealing from other people. So if you, I talk to any of you and I hear a good idea, I am going to run with it. So I can't take all the credit. We just mold stuff to us. So get that out of the way. Um, we Consumers these days are peppered so much, right? Like we, as consumers, everywhere we go, we're getting peppered with offers and banking services are everywhere. Um, and we're no longer just competing with the other credit union or the other you know, traditional bank down the road. We've got, you know, fintechs and everything else. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that everyone is just completely inundated with offers and everyone's checking account looks just like everyone else's checking account, right? I don't care what offers you're giving to a consumer. It's a checking account. Does it do my things? So we really, um, here at the credit union, we're really trying to shift away from 
our primary directed messaging and specifically more on a marketing strategy away from products. And we still have that, right? Like I just mentioned, we're going to have an auto promo next month and that's still going to be advertised on my website. I'm still going to put that out on my social media. But when I'm directly communicating with my members, I'm actually steering into things that are um, not product centric. So we do a lot of giveaways here. Um, we do, you know, like uh, just past summer, we gave away a free dream vacation, no purchase necessary. You could win a valued up to $5,000 dream vacation. Um, we do a lot of community engagement. We just gave $30,000 to the American Cancer Society, you know, um, so that really near and dear to our heart. So when my uh, members see our name pop up on their email or in a text or something like that, most of the time it's not product driven it's feel good driven and, or it's something in their benefit. Like, Hey, you know, free um, concert at the, there's a park right across the street from me that they're building right now. You know, we might, you know, free, uh, you know, entry to this concert for our members. So we want them when they see our name pop up on their, their inbox or their text, not to be like, Oh crap, Buckeye's trying to solicit me for something else. We want to get them excited with it and say, Oh, cool. What are they doing? And I know I'm taking a lot of time here, Lori, the, la the reason that we do that is we tried to look through the lens. If our members were to look at Buckeye as a person, do you want to hang out with us? Do you want to go have a beer with us? Do you want, do you want to hear from us? Or are we that annoying uncle that no one wants to hang out with? And um, so we really want to try to connect on the personal side first. And we feel that if we do that the right way, the products will, will come. So as a marketer, I do think that's really smart. And I know that it can be tempting to say that that kind of stuff is squishy and doesn't generate revenue. But I would just remind you that back in the day, SoulCycle and Zappos built their businesses on those positionings. So it can yeah. definitely work. I'll just say one more thing too, that, you know, we, yes, we, there's a lot of factors that go into it. We all got a lot of stimulus money over the last few years. Um, but with that strategy, we have doubled in asset size in the last three years. There you go. Another proof point. Um, and Melissa, I wanted to talk to you about your final words of wisdom. Um, and, and one of the topics we spent a lot of time talking about was friction, which we obviously think a lot about. And I know you're pretty obsessed with identifying um, points of friction. Tell me a little bit about what goes on over there and how do you how you view it. Sure, I'll have to steal Daniel's broken record. I'll have to have my own collection. Um, but some of it comes down to, I guess, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about solving problems. It's similar to what Daniel had said, um, but the idea to gain buy-in for this, right? If you're sitting on this call and thinking, you know, my executive team's not going to go for this. They don't understand this. I urge you to ask your colleagues, ask cross-functional teams, ask retail, ask operations, ask, you know, call center, whoever is customer facing, ask them to give you the top five pain points you see that are solvable, not I want higher rates of, you know, stuff that everybody wants. Just think through those. And then you can back into this pretty easily to say that, well, digital onboard can solve for X of this. And even if you don't go with digital onboarding, just having that knowledge that you could bring it up when there's a solution in front of you again, of like saying, you know, e-statements are a problem. Well, you know, compliance and regulations say we can't do it, make it this easy. Well, you can, you just need to be a little more creative. And maybe that's the foot in the door, the first widget you use. So my experience with digital onboarding has been small wins. You know, I had a merger. So I was like, oh, well, that's a big behemoth of a win. But I'm like, we need this now. It took me two years to get it, by the way. We need this now. So I will give you my advice. If I can rewind two years ago, I would have started and done that simple task. So know what the pain points are. Like Lori, Daniel Adams said, find out from the customer if you can, but just utilize your teams. Now they're like, that was my pain point. I told you about that. So now they're going to raise their hand of who needs this. So just words of wisdom, yeah. if I could go back. I just thought it was so smart, right? It's 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 an easy thing. Well, I don't know if it's easy, but you know, to ask the group that has the knowledge. I mean, actually, we co-developed this platform with DCU, with the head of member service, member experience, because she knew what those pain points were, um, and that's actually what this came out of. So I thought that advice was just really on point. Um, all right. I think that concludes our session for today. I want to deeply thank Melissa and Daniel for all of the great advice you shared. Thanks, Adam, for doing a fabulous demo. You can find us on LinkedIn um, or send us an email if you'd like to meet. Thanks for coming, and I hope you all have an awesome day.